In Houston, Texas, gunfire erupts on an autumn night. On the trail of the gunman, investigators find only hazy accounts and vague rumors. When a killer targets one of their own, local prosecutors work tirelessly to find justice for a fallen friend. When an assistant DA is gunned down, District Attorney Chuck Rosenthal and the Houston law enforcement community must act fast to find and stop a killer. We thought it was an urgent situation just because of the, um, of the randomness of the, of the act. It got the attention of the, of the neighborhood and of the community. Of course, they wanted to know who it was that did this and we would bring them to, to justice before they were able to hurt other folks. On the night of September 18, 1996, Sean Carruthers and his friend Gil Epstein left Houston's Jewish Community Center after an evening playing basketball. They had been playing weekly pickup games for the past two years. Outside the building, the two walked off in different directions toward their cars. Moments later in the parking lot, Carruthers saw two men on bicycles. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, and he continued across the lot to his car. Then one of the men rode up to his car and pulled a gun. He demanded Carruthers' wallet. Hey man, throw that window down, man, and give me your money. Come on now, give it to me. Come on, man. Give me some money now. Hurry up, man. Come on, they got all day. That's all you got is three dollars, man. That's all I got. Come on, man. I know you got some more money in there. Come on, man. Carruthers found five dollars tucked in the ashtray. Look, look. Here, there it is. Take it. Get out of here. The robber ordered him to leave. Hurry up. Instead, he drove out of view of the robber and ran back into the community center. He told the desk clerk to call the police. Then returned to the parking lot to check on his friend. At first, the lot appeared to be empty. Then Carruthers spotted the man who had robbed him, along with the other man he had seen earlier. They were near Gil Epstein's car. He tried to draw attention to himself, hoping to scare off the robbers and to alert any arriving police officers. The tactic infuriated the assailants. One of the men got on his bicycle and rode straight toward Carruthers' car. The man on the bike tried to veer off at the last second, but was hit and thrown to the ground. It didn't look like the same man who had robbed him earlier. Eventually, the assailant fled. Carruthers had lost sight of the other man, the one who had robbed him. Carruthers returned to the lobby to make sure the police were on their way. The center security guard said she had heard gunshots in the parking lot. Come on now, come on now, just shoot, come on, guys. Carruthers and the desk clerk went back outside. The young man found his friend, Gil Epstein, in the back seat of the car. 
I went and uh, opened the door and Gil was in the back seat. He had a bullet wound to his head. We checked to see if uh, he had a pulse and he did and his heart was beating. And shortly after that, I would say maybe a minute or a minute and a half, a police officer pulled up. Epstein was still alive. They rushed him to the hospital. Carruthers described the man who had robbed him, but he told police he wasn't sure about the man he had hit with his car. I don't think I got a real good look at him, even from the time uh, he was walking towards my car, from the time I hit him on the bicycle, from the time he got up and pointed a gun at my car. The center's security guard told officers she got a fleeting glimpse of the assailants in the parking lot. Police processed the crime scene, worried that intermittent rainstorms would destroy evidence. The difficult task was organized by Houston Police Sergeant Hub Mayer. Out at the scene, uh, you know, the weather was bad, and we knew that, that it was supposed to rain some more. Uh, we had got a weather forecast that some heavy rain was coming in again. And so we picked up a small part of the, the evidence that was outside. Um, you know, blood, blood spatter had evidently already been washed away by the time we got there. But there was a bullet, a 380 fired bullet found outside the driver door. Police sent the evidence to the ballistics lab for testing. To help track the assailants, a bloodhound handler was called to the scene. They came out and uh, they took scent samples from the bicycles. Um, officer covered them up and so they removed it, took a little patch of uh, sterile gauze and they rubbed it over the, the seat area, places that normally wouldn't find fingerprints. And uh, they scented their dogs off of it. The bloodhound led officers on the suspect's trail from the crime scene. They went with their dogs uh, uh, through, the, through the neighborhood, and uh, they actually went about a mile away uh, from the scene to a p uh, pizza parlor, and that's where they, they lost them at, was at a phone booth on the outside of that pizza parlor. Unable to track the suspects further, Sergeant Mayer went to the hospital to get an update on Epstein's condition. We spoke to the doctor that had uh, taken care of uh, Mr. Epstein and also pronounced him dead, and he was very upset uh, you could see that he was just visibly shaken. We asked him, you know, what was wrong? And he said that uh, Gil Epstein was a very, very close friend of his. And he was just so upset that we, you know, that, that he saw you see his own friend there and have to treat him for something like that. Gil Epstein's death turned the case into a murder investigation. His father, Baruch Epstein, remembers that night. At the uh... 2.55 a.m., uh, my in-laws knocked on the door and I opened up and I said, why are you here? And they said, an accident happened in uh, Houston and uh, Gil is injured. And then they gave me the uh, cellular telephone and uh, my daughter-in-law told me that he actually was killed. Epstein was an assistant district attorney in the Fort Bend County Prosecutor's Office, working under District Attorney John Healy. Gil Epstein came to our office as an intern in 1994, and he had a, a real spark of energy and had a quick wit, and he had the kind of personality that we were looking for in a prosecutor. He had a lot going for him. On the evening of the 18th of September, 1996, I got a call from a close friend of mine who was a defense attorney and knew Gil quite well, and he called and let me know that Gil had been shot. And we, we went down to the, the hospital. 
we were hoping against hope that he'd survive. And when we realized that he was gone, there were a lot of tears in that room and a lot of people were crying and sobbing openly. Processing Epstein's car, evidence technicians located a bullet slug. It had exited the victim, passed through the car's interior, and come to rest in the trunk. A trajectory rod was inserted into the hole created by the bullet. The rod indicated the bullet's path, suggesting the shot had been fired from the front passenger seat. Technicians collected two 380 caliber shell casings from the floor of the car. If the shots were fired from inside the vehicle, the man Sean Carruthers saw leaving the car was most likely the killer. At the police station, Carruthers tried to identify the men he had seen in the parking lot the night his friend was shot. No, none of these guys. You can't be close. I want to but looking this. through mugshots, he did not find anyone resembling either man. Carruthers worked with a police sketch artist to come up with a likeness of the man on the bicycle he had hit. Detectives believed this man was Gil Epstein's killer. Carruthers was frustrated that he couldn't remember all the details. I felt that um, if I had had a better look, if it hadn't have been dark outside, um, if I hadn't have been as excited as I was, maybe I, um, I didn't feel I was as reliable as I wanted to be. But uh, the police officers just assured me, they said, the memories are there, just take it easy, uh, and just tell us what you remember, exactly what you remember. The sketch was inexact. When the police asked me some questions concerning one of them, I thought he was either a Latino or he could have been a white guy, in my opinion. With the only potential eyewitness unable to give authorities a good description of the shooter, Sergeant Mayer began to look for possible suspects from the victim's past. You know, we knew that Mr. Epstein was a, a Fort Bend County District Attorney, and so uh, we looked uh, to see if it was possibly a hit from some of his uh, caseload at, at Fort Bend County District Attorney's Office, but it was just for a very short time, and then we went to a just straight robbery where he was shot. the sergeant went to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy report. The autopsy confirmed that Epstein was killed by a 380 caliber handgun. The gunpowder burns around the wounds were two to three inches in diameter, indicating that the victim had been shot at very close range. To find the assailants, detectives sought help from the local Crime Stoppers organization. Uh, the Crime Stoppers program here in Houston is an is a excellent, very helpful organization to law enforcement. And they put up uh, money uh, for various crimes, and uh, it's in the form of a reward. And they will actually do reenactments of, of the incident. They'll put out bulletins. Uh, they'll have the newspapers put out uh, uh, bulletins also. And uh, it's, it's just very, very helpful. Police also turned to the press for help, releasing sketches of the suspects and photos of the bicycles they had left behind. They asked anyone with information to call the Crime Stoppers hotline. Tips could remain anonymous, and rewards were offered for information. We got publicity on every channel. Uh, everyone uh, that was there put out some kind of an article, so it was a real good press conference. Homicide, Mayor. Just days after the murder, the media coverage yielded a solid lead. Sure, go ahead. We're taking any Police received an anonymous tip. The caller gave them something they didn't have in the case, a name. 
Detectives hoped it would lead them to whoever had gunned down assistant DA Gil Epstein. <laughs> Authorities in Houston, Texas, were investigating the murder of assistant DA Gil Epstein. Dozens of leads were called into their tip line. One finally paid off for Sergeant Hub Mayer. I'm sorry, Mayor. To me, uh, Go ahead. The, the phone call that gets you back on track, that, that gives you information, I always refer to it as the magical phone call because it's information that you get from them that no one knows about except the investigators that are handling the case. Uh, the individual told us that it was a, a Mark Cotton or a Mark Cobbs that did it, that he was a light-skinned black male, that he was with a darker-skinned black male by the name of TC, that they had been riding bicycles, and that they had used a 380. Uh, Thank you. Mark Cotton had uh, used a 380 to shoot uh, Mr. Epstein. No one knew that press didn't know it had never been released, so we knew that that was correct. The caller agreed to meet with investigators. I'm uh, Officer Huseman, and uh, this is Sergeant Mayer, and we're just here to ask you a few questions. First of all, we were wondering if you could help us to... They showed him a photo spread made up of driver's license photos. Okay, do you mind looking at a picture and... and they asked her to point out the man she had heard was involved with the murder. Okay, here it is. She immediately picked out Marcus Cotton. That's him, right there. I'm positive about that. Positive. She also heard that a man nicknamed Little Boo was now in possession of the murder weapon. Detectives passed the information to the night shift team of Sergeant D.D. D. Shirley and Sergeant Hal Kennedy. Well, typically in any murder investigation, you know, what's known as a whodunit, where you really don't know who the suspect is, and especially in a robbery murder, uh, it's passed from shift to shift. Detectives that are originally working on the case never give it up. They stay with it the whole time. This time, the two shifts worked the case together to determine Marcus Cotton's last known address. Detectives set up surveillance in a vacant apartment across from Cotton's residence. Yeah. Is that, Cotton going in there? that afternoon, they spotted a young man acting suspiciously near the apartment's front door. Eventually, a man went inside. Minutes later, detectives watched as the man left the apartment through a window. The duffel bag he carried concerned Sergeant Kennedy. He's coming out the window. He's got it. With the gym bag, I thought he was leaving town. I arrested the man right there. Police officer, don't move. Hold him right there. Put your hands on the wall. Hey, what are you doing? It turned out not to be Marcus Cotton. It was a friend of his. I'm not doing anything all the time. I'm going to get my stuff. You live here? Yeah. The bag contained clothing and other personal items. The man said he had left them in the apartment and was just retrieving them. Detectives interviewed the man at the police station. His statement confirmed what they had heard before that Marcus Cotton and a man named T.C. were involved in the murder. And that little Boo had bought the weapon from Cotton after the shooting. Based on a tip, police located the man known as Little Boo and asked him about the gun. He had spoke with uh, Mr. Cotton and uh, that uh, he had uh, heard him bragging about uh, doing the killing and uh, that they, they had been at the scene, him and TC uh, did it. Um, and uh, so I'm so done. that he'd gotten so rid of the gun the and, and so forth. But that was, that was basically it. He just, 
he was trying to make himself uh, not be a party of it, uh, that he never got the gun. I'm not sure. Uh, but he knew everything that, about it. That he sold it to that one person. Never. Have you ever seen him sell guns? Once. But Little Brew would never be able to testify if the case made it to court. Uh, a few days um, after we had spoken to Boo for the first time, uh, uh, we learned that he had been murdered in a, in a triple killing here in Houston. And if you'll uh, look around the kitchen area, I think we can get this covered. Pretty Yet the statements obtained by police allowed them to secure a search warrant for Marcus Cotton's apartment. Uh, when the officers entered the, the apartment, uh, they saw a, a uh, 380 hole in open view and also, I believe, a box of 380 uh, shells. It was the same caliber as the weapon used to kill Assistant District Attorney okay. Gil Epstein. Crime Stoppers said the suspect named TC might be staying at his aunt's apartment and gave that address. The woman who answered the door confirmed that her nephew went by the nickname TC. She said he was inside. TC's real name was Lawrence Watson. When Lawrence Watson was arrested by members of our division inside his aunt's apartment, he immediately started telling them things in regards to this offense. Uh, he told them that he would plan to turn himself in, that he wanted to talk about it, and that he was more than willing to go down to the homicide division and give him a statement in regards to what happened. In his statement, Watson admitted to being in the Jewish Community Center's parking lot on the night of the murder. He said he saw Marcus Cotton kill Gil Epstein. In the car. In the car. Yep. All right. How about the robbery? But Watson denied robbing Sean Carruthers. Rob, uh, what do you say? Name is Carruthers. No, I didn't rob him. That's all I did. What gang do you hang with? Watson admitted to being a member of the Gangster Disciples, a known violent gang in the area. And where do they hang? Assistant District Attorney Chuck Rosenthal had been following the case. He knew Watson's statement was pivotal to the investigation. Then when he first talked to the police, we were able to piece together uh, a lot of what did happen, whether it was whether we could use it in testimony or not. So we knew what the truth was. Police asked robbery victim Sean Carruthers to come to the station. If he is, please point him out and uh, find number. They placed Watson and several other men in a lineup for Carruthers to view. He immediately recognized Lawrence Watson as the man who robbed him in the parking lot. No, you don't forget a face of a person who puts a gun to your head. You never forget that face. Watson was held without bail. Now detectives needed to find Marcus Cotton, the man they believed killed Gil Epstein. Uh, we had had information, yeah, he's hiding out, and he keeps a pump shotgun, and he said that, you know, he could get two cops before they get him, and he's not going back to prison. And uh, so we kept looking for him. At the same time, we were looking for the gun and just hitting all these folks and hitting all these folks, and then uh, another source uh, gave some information uh, indicating that uh, where he was at. An arrest team surrounded the apartment. If Cotton were inside, he could be armed and ready for a shootout. In late 1996 in Houston, Texas, Assistant District Attorney Gil Epstein was murdered in a community center parking lot. Authorities believed they knew where to find the alleged killer, Marcus Cotton. Right. I, I don't understand what's going on. You understand those rights? I got you. 
screwed up. A week after the murder, police arrested Cotton without incident. Uh, Mike, do you want to get uh, a shot of this shin? And let me see it right on both. Okay, Detectives right noted on. wounds on Cotton's leg okay. that could have been received the night of the murder. When eyewitness Sean Carruthers struck the assailant with his car. Although Carruthers identified Cotton in a police lineup, the security guard from the Jewish Community Center picked out the wrong man. Number five. Number five? You're absolutely positive. 100%? Definitely. Despite this, Assistant District Attorneys Lucy Davidson and Chuck Rosenthal charged Cotton with capital murder. It didn't concern us that there was a uh, discrepancy between Sean Carruthers and the, and the security guard. Uh, Carruthers obviously had a better opportunity uh, to see uh, Cotton than anyone else because he saw him in the headlights of his car and he actually hit him. Prosecutors believed their case was strong. Cotton's court-appointed defense team included attorney Mac Arnold. There's no greater pressure in the practice of law than representing someone who's on trial for their life. Uh, Civil lawyers fight over enormous amounts of, amounts of money, but you can always go make some more money. You can't regenerate a life. The defense strategy was to exploit discrepancies in eyewitness testimony to create reasonable doubt as to their client's guilt. The trial began at the Harris County District Courthouse on April 7, 1997, six months after Gil Epstein was killed. Marcus Cotton was charged with capital murder. The state was seeking the death penalty. All right. The Honorable Michael T. McSpatton presided. To prove Cotton was guilty of the murder, prosecutors would first have to prove he was at the scene of the crime. Chuck Rosenthal believed he could do that despite the fact that the state's key eyewitnesses provided differing descriptions of the killer. Okay, one of the things that uh, I frequently point out to jurors is, you know, I, th I think every juror in Harris County has probably seen the Astrodome. Uh, whether or not they could describe it, um, I don't know that they could. I mean, you know, what color it was, how many entrances it has. Uh, but they certainly could recognize it if you put it in a, in a lineup with other domed stadiums in, across the United States. I do. The prosecution called the bloodhound handler whose dog had tracked the killer's scent. The handler had taken swabs from the assailant's bicycle. His bloodhound led authorities for a mile, but then the trail went cold. Once Cotton was in custody, a forensic okay. technician secured a scent sample from him. Placing that sample near four distractor samples taken from men with similar characteristics as Cotton, authorities conducted a field test. And uh, the dog was able to identify the uh, correct scent patch from uh, a uh, scent patch that was taken from the seat of the bicycle at the scene something different about the, the scene. prosecution claimed the bloodhound's ability to link the two scent samples cases, proved that cotton was in the jewish uh, community center parking lot on the night of the murder he would go in sort of an alert status is that correct yes. but the defense and believed the bloodhound evidence was flawed and, and fought to prevent the dog handler from who, uh, testifying at the trial owns the bloodhounds that, he's uh, in effect speaking for the dog and having to interpret what the dog uh, is telling him and saying to him uh, by his actions. And so I'm getting to cross-examine an interpretation of what the dog is saying. Thank you, Your Honor. When the judge allowed the testimony, like the defense the attacked it. That, uh, Mr. Watson and uh, Mr. Cotton. They pointed out that the bicycle did not belong to the defendant. He may have ridden the bike, but so had many other people.
This bicycle was a community bicycle shared by everyone who lived in an apartment complex, including my client Marcus Cotton. It would seem to me to easily follow that if Marcus Cotton had ridden the bicycle any time during the past preceding 30 days that his scent would be on there. The scents that are on the bike. The you dog handler conceded reason. that the bloodhound would have been correct to trail any of the scents on the bike, not just Cotton's. Different scents on the bike. The we testimony allowed for the possibility that someone scent. other than the defendant could have ridden the bike to the Jewish community you, you center, really then run off on the night of the murder. The next prosecution witness was the security guard who worked at the Jewish community center. She was asked to describe what she saw that night. Good afternoon. At 9.45, what were you doing on September the 18th, 1996? I was at the Jewish Community Center. At 9.45, the front desk shuts down. The security guard said she was locking up the electric cart used to patrol the lot. She looked up and saw a man pointing a gun at another man. She only saw the assailant's profile and described him as a light-skinned black male, about five feet, seven inches tall, wearing a baseball cap and a light-colored shirt. The security guard ran to the back entrance. As she entered, she heard a gunshot from the parking lot. She found that the desk clerk was already calling 911. Although the security guard was initially unable to pick Marcus Cotton out of a lineup, Prosecutors Chuck Rosenthal and Lucy Davidson had given her a second chance. Chuck and I decided to let her look at another lineup just to see if after time had gone by, she was more willing to come forward because Chuck and I always believed she knew who was out there in that parking lot and could identify him. She was just too afraid to do it. It was five months after the first lineup. At the security guard's request, police instructed each of the men to wear a baseball cap. Do you see? Number two. Number two. This time, she identified Marcus Cotton. Okay. Mr. Evans, when you patrol the ground... In its cross-examination, the defense cast doubt on the security guard's ability to identify Cotton in a lineup five months after the crime. She had failed to identify him in a similar lineup just eight days into the investigation. What was the difference? What was the difference between the first lineup where you could not identify him, where you identified someone else, and the second lineup where you identified him? What was the difference? Yes. There was no difference. Thank you. No further questions. Defense attorney Mac Arnold contended that several factors contributed to the security guard identifying his client in the second lineup. By the time she went to the second lineup, Marcus Cotton's picture had been in the paper on numerous occasions, and she certainly knew that he was a short, light-skinned black male. Number two. Number two. Are you, are you sure? okay. And Marcus Cotton was placed in a lineup with five other black males, all of whom were darker, much darker skinned and for the most part, all taller than he was. And, uh, In addition to witnesses night, who were at the crime scene, the prosecution also called witnesses who spoke to the defendant after the crime was committed. And do you remember roughly uh, what time it was? A 16-year-old girl was a recent acquaintance of Cotton's. Where were you sitting? Uh, do you remember where you were when you were having this conversation? Um, he was sitting on the ledge and I was just standing on the porch. Just after the murder, she spoke to him at a barbecue. He said he had done something he regretted, killing a district attorney. And, uh, the girl also testified about a possible motive for the murder. She told the police that Marcus Cotton had admitted to her to killing Gil Epstein um, because he saw his badge. In Texas, District attorneys carry badges similar to those carried by police officers. Prosecutors believed Cotton killed Epstein when he mistook him for a cop. The defense challenged the girl's credibility. 
she told the uh, my investigator on a tape recorded statement that Marcus had never told her anything like uh, the story that that she later told on the stand. She, as a matter of fact, she denied that Marcus had ever told her anything like that. Why would he do that? The girl admitted to he lying earlier, but insisted she was now telling the truth under oath. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. The defense found it unlikely that Cotton would so casually confess to murder. But prosecutors believe they knew why he would. Knowing Marcus Cotton, I think he thought it made him look so big to everybody else that he hung out with because he's the only person he knows that has killed somebody with a badge. A number of witnesses testified that the defendant owned a 380 semi-automatic pistol, the same type of weapon used to kill Epstein. Cotton was alleged to have sold the murder weapon to a man called Little Boo, who was killed in an unrelated shooting weeks after telling police he had sold the weapon to someone else. Prosecutors called the person who last owned the gun. He confirmed that before police took custody of the weapon, he bought it from Little Boo. We would have liked to have been able to call him to the stand because he was the one who actually purchased the gun from Marcus Cotton after he killed Gil Epstein. We were able to work around it using other witnesses um, and trace the, the way the gun went until it ended up in the hands of the police. Ballistics testing proved that it was the gun that killed Epstein. The defense used the witness to establish its theory that Little Boo could have been the gunman. I have no further questions. Defense, your witness? They contended Little Boo fit the description of the killer, given by both Sean Carruthers and the security guard. Mr. Boo, I believe um, you've identified a photograph here as Little Boo. Yes, sir. This gentleman here? Yes, sir. Uh, Little if Boo, you were describing like Marcus Cotton by height, weight, etc. you were describing Little Boo as well. We know that Little Boo at one point was in possession of the murder weapon in this case. We would like to have called Little Boo uh, to the stand, but he had been killed in an unrelated shootout. Is it true that Little Boo... The witness also testified that Little Boo was a member of the Gangster Disciples, as was Lawrence Watson, who had admitted being at the crime scene. Prosecutors decided not to call Watson as a witness. We decided not to because we thought the testimony of Sean Carruthers was so powerful. And we had other corroborating evidence to his identification that we felt we could make the case without him. Another witness? The defense had deftly countered each of the state's arguments and put forth an alternate theory of who killed Epstein. To convince the jury that Cotton was the killer, the state would need compelling testimony from a credible witness. They were counting on Epstein's friend, Sean Carruthers, to provide that testimony. Two men on bicycles. Marcus Cotton was charged with capital murder in the shooting death of Assistant District Attorney Gil Epstein. Prosecutors had little physical evidence to link Cotton to the crime. They would rely on eyewitness testimony from Sean Carruthers, a friend of the victim who was with him moments before the shooting and who had come face to face with the killer. Okay. Now, Carruthers testified that he had struck the gunman with his car on the night of the murder and believed he could identify him. Now, uh, can you indicate who he is and an item of clothing that he's wearing? It's that man right there with the red tie. I presume you know why you're here. Unlike many of the people who implicated Cotton, Carruthers refused to accept reward money. The prosecution believed this made Carruthers more credible to the jury. I don't feel that anyone should profit off the death of another person. I, would, I, f I felt that would just be a slap, into, a slap in Gill's face. The defense chose not to question Sean Carruthers at the cross-examination stage. Prosecution, do you have any more witnesses? No further witnesses, Your Honor. And with that, the state of Texas rests its case in chief.
Defense, you may present your case, please. Your Honor, the defense would like to call to the stand Sean Carruthers. Now it was the defense's turn to put on its case. Calling Carruthers to the stand was a surprise move. The defense argued that the witness only got a fleeting glimpse of the gunman, making it impossible for him to positively identify Cotton as the killer. Carruthers couldn't even be sure about the gunman's race. Um, the person you identified out there uh, that night, uh, what, what is your opinion of his race? Uh, when I say that, I mean the person you identified as Mr. Cotton. Well, initially, I thought he was either Latino or a white guy. Which one of the two do you think it is? The defense pointed out that the lineup in which the witness identified Cotton contained no Latino or white men. Mr. Carruthers, on how many occasions did you tell members of the Houston Police Department that you did not think you could identify the light-skinned male? I think on one occasion. No further questions for this witness, Your Honor. Defense attorney Mac Arnold put Marcus Cotton's father on the stand to explain the injuries police found on his son's leg. The prosecution believed the injuries were caused when the defendant was hit by Carruthers' car. The fact that Marcus had, had injuries needed to be refuted. Uh, if he had no explanation for those injuries, and the injuries were consistent with the type of injuries he would have received by being knocked off a bicycle, uh, it would indicate that he was the person at the scene that night. Cotton's father testified that around the time of the murder, he and his son had a foot race up the stairs at their apartment complex. He slipped. His left leg got cut and, and his right elbow. So he slipped and fell on the stairs? Yes, sir. Thank you. Marcus Cotton's dad uh, obviously loved him, cared about him, wanted to protect him. What we tried to do was just point that out to the jury. The defense called several police officers to the stand. Some testified that Cotton's fingerprints were never found at the scene of the crime in Epstein's car or on the murder weapon. Police officer with Houston. Mr. Kennedy, as a result of they called police sergeant Hal Kennedy, who had arrested a man outside Cotton's apartment. Yes, he did. And would you say that? During a search of the apartment, police had recovered a 380 caliber shell. Ballistics tests linked the shell to the murder weapon. The defense claimed the man caught outside the apartment had the opportunity to plant the shell as part of a plan to frame Cotton for the murder. After four days of testimony, both sides rested. The jury began its deliberations. They deliberated for 21 frustrating hours. Then they wrote a note to Judge McSpadden. This is from the delivery jury. The judge learned that the jury was hopelessly deadlocked. Get a hold of defense and prosecuting attorneys and bring them back to the courtroom. Yes, sir. If they could not agree on a verdict, Marcus Cotton could go free. In Houston, Texas, Marcus Cotton was on trial for the murder of Assistant District Attorney Gil Epstein. 21 hours into deliberations, the jury informed the judge they were deadlocked. With no hope for resolution. One of the jurors had refused to deliberate. The others had agreed on a verdict. The judge had no choice but to declare a mistrial. A second trial was scheduled to begin seven months later. It gave both the prosecution and the defense time to refine their cases. Prosecutors wanted to call the same witnesses, plus Lawrence Watson, the man who admitted being at the scene of the crime. Uh, the picture is, uh, 
Sean Carruthers had been robbed by Watson on the night of the murder. The prosecutors sought his permission before offering Watson a plea bargain. He consented. Mr. Watson, um, I felt and I still feel that there's hope for him. Uh, Mr. Cotton, on the other hand, uh, picking him out of the lineup and looking into his eyes, I just had this eerie feeling that he was just a total lost soul, that there was no hope for him. Prosecutors Chuck Rosenthal and Lucy Davidson would have another eyewitness on the stand. We offered to plead Lawrence Watson to the offense of aggravated robbery for the um, robbery of Sean Carruthers, and he would receive a 10-year prison sentence based on his plea of guilty. However, the deal was only good, and it was couched on the truthful testimony of Lawrence Watson. At the second trial, Watson testified that he and Cotton had been looking for someone to rob in the Jewish Community Center parking lot. They saw Sean Carruthers. Watson said the defendant urged him to rob the young man. He testified that he then rode his bike to Gil Epstein's car, where Cotton was. When you went over, what did you see? Epstein said he didn't have any money, but he did have something valuable in the car that Cotton would want. Epstein searched for the item, but couldn't find it. Hey, man, somebody coming, man. Defense attorney Mac Arnold immediately called Lawrence Watson's credibility into question. We certainly wanted the jury to know that uh, he had lied under oath when he had given that first statement, and he's just back up there talking under oath again. Watson admitted to being a member of the Gangster Disciples street gang. He said that Marcus Cotton was not a member. The defense contended that Watson committed the murder with a fellow gang member, whom he was now protecting. Yes, sir. And uh, you've uh, admitted to a few attempts to get kept by They pointed out that the gang punishment for informing on a fellow member is death. After Lawrence Watson's testimony, the jury was given the case. This time, the jurors deliberated only 58 minutes. They found Marcus Cotton guilty of capital murder. He was sentenced to death. For Chuck Rosenthal and Lucy Davidson, it was the end of a long struggle to find justice for a fellow prosecutor. I mean, we carry badges here in Harris County as prosecutors, and his badge is what got him killed. I wish I'd known him. He did what we did. He believed in the justice system. I was glad that the system worked for, for Gil the way it did.